So good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Hatan Simtani. I'm the editorial director at The Real Deal. And we're here to talk about a topic that people generally try to avoid because it doesn't make for pleasant conversation. But we're here to talk about sea level rise and the implications for the market. And we have a stack panel here to describe and talk about some of these issues. So Miami is a city that really is what it is today because of its relationship with water. Right? You have the art and the culture and the museums, but it really flows from the sun, the beach, the sand, the surf. And that's really how Miami took off and became a global destination. However, that is also a major risk. Right? Miami and South Florida in general is seeing some of the fastest sea level rise in the country. And financially, it has the most to lose from these events. It is the most exposed in terms of development, in terms of projects to sea level rise. So we've got a pretty stacked panel here, all-star panel, to talk about this. My immediate left is Francis Suarez. He's the Miami City Commissioner. And if you Google Francis's name in the last two weeks, the top hits are lock for mayor, you know, shoe in for mayor. So as something he says today could really well become policy tomorrow. So Francis, welcome. Thank you. On his left is someone who's worked with him for a long time, uh, Bruce Mowry, who's the city engineer for Miami Beach. He is our voice of reason on this panel. I hope everyone will be. But he really is like, I'm going to be pretty outspoken. I said, absolutely. This is the place to do it. So welcome, Bruce. Thank you for being with us. We don't know about reason or not. <laughs> to his left is Patrick Murphy. Patrick is a principal at Coastal Construction, so one of the largest general contractors in the South Florida area. They've worked on Miami Beach Edition. They're doing the Paramount World Center. And Patrick knows a thing or two about politics. He served in Congress in the 18th District of Florida for four years. Patrick, welcome and thank you. And uh, the only man not wearing a tie here, uh, so you can tell he's the architect in the, in the crowd, is, is Kobe Karp. Kobe is one of the pioneers in bringing sustainable and adaptive design to South Florida. He has seen the market when it was a nothing market. And he's seen the market when it was a ridiculous market. He's been through it all, and he's thrived. And Kobe, welcome. So Francis, I'd like to start with you. And uh, you know, in two weeks, I can't call you Francis anymore, so I'm relishing this opportunity. But uh, we just went through a major disaster in, in South Florida. And there is a tendency, after a big event like this happens, to kind of push it out of mind. The worst is gone, and you know, we can just Focus on going the way we've gone. Why is that such a dangerous way of thinking? Well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, people often ask me, why are you running for mayor? Look around this room. That's why I'm running for mayor. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the people uh, who create this, this new Miami, this vibe and this buzz that we have here in the city of Miami, make it exciting to be an elected official here in the city and potentially serve as, as your mayor. Uh, it, it's important to learn from what I call short-term shocks to the system, like hurricanes. We're living already in a post-Irma world where we saw, regardless of what you want to call it, what, what you want to call the phenomenon, we saw four-foot storm surges in downtown Miami. And we had water all the way to Second Avenue. And I know that because I went out in the middle of the hurricane in a SWAT vehicle, and we literally um, had four feet of water up to, up to your, about your knee about four and a half blocks into the city. So we, uh, those images were out there, and I know many of you who are in the real estate business, that worries you. And so I think uh, it's incumbent on us as leaders to first of all, uh, learn from the experiences that we uh, engage in and not forget them. I think part of preparation is not forgetting what just happened. And I think the second part is, we have to understand that from an engineering perspective, uh, we have to have, as resilient climatically a city as we possibly can have. Why? Because all of you and your clients are making investment decisions. And most of your investment decisions are long-term decisions. When you buy a property, most of the time it's a long-term decision. And so what we want to avoid is people who are scared or skeptical of the long-term prospects of the city. So we got to do a good job, and I have to do a great job as an elected official of making you feel secure that we're doing everything in our power so that we're going to be here for a very, very long time and very dry. Bruce, I want to bring you in as well. Uh, what are developers doing wrong at this point from what you've seen in your experience working through many, many administrations? And 
what are developers doing wrong when it comes to designing the projects? Kobe, I'd like you to jump in as well. Uh, but there is, there is a tendency to avoid the difficult work because it's not paying off in a higher price per foot. So what do you think they could do different? Thank you. Um, the key issue is that I think some developers are still not fully realizing, and, uh, and even architects, uh, what the impact of climate change are and uh, sea level rise. Uh, it's real. Uh, and uh, as, But we shouldn't be scared of it. We should be actually understand that this is a change. It's occurring. Uh, your life has changed through your life. We never had emails before, and I was just talking to Kobe. I said we should be no more fearful of sea level rise and climate change than we are emails. So the question is, you take care of them, and you do it, and you work forward. Um, what we have to do is we need to work towards that direction. The key issue that I see is that many people are not giving the respect to it in their new developments. They have to understand they're putting an investment, and even though they may get a return and pay off that investment, maybe in a 20 or 30 year period or less, uh, that building's probably gonna be there for close to 100 years. We need to design that building to think about what will be the conditions 100 years from now. So and let's so say we have a home flipper who's, who's looking for a quick payout. Then, then I guess the responsibility falls on the city to create some sort of codes that don't allow them to get away with a responsible building, right? That is correct. And I think to a certain extent, you know, to do the right thing, sometimes it's better if you go ahead and go into like your building code and actually make a change. And some of the things in the building code, I think, really don't really address climate change or sea level rise. And Kobe and I have had this conversation before. Uh, the ability to allow a flood panel, to me, is not an acceptable practice. Most people do not put a flood panel up once they build their building. So what it is, it's almost a gimmick is what I call it. Many people criticize me for using that statement, but as I told you, I'm vocal and honest about everything. But uh, the question is, and they also think a sea, uh, flood panel will protect them against sea level rise. Neither one of those statements are true. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, we need to go back and go to our decision makers, our elected officials, our mayors, our representatives, our governor, and so forth, and push for the issue of let's make a change to the building code so everybody basically understands the standard. Uh, a lot of architects will say, give us what the criteria is and we'll design to it. Well, they only want to do what's an accepted and approved because they don't want a competitive disadvantage mm -hmm. that somebody says, I'll design something lesser. So we need to bring a bar up. And so I think changing the building code is one of the key issues we need to address this. Kobe, uh, given where the bar is now, let's say things hopefully will change and, and more rigid systems will be put in place. But given where the bar is now, how do you have that conversation with those developer clients saying, look, this is going to cost maybe, I don't know, 200 grand more, half a million more, but this is something you're going to want in your buildings. And, and then how do you push back if they, if they don't go where you need to, them to go? So number one, Bruce is 100% correct. We are right now oh, where we were with Hurricane Impact Glass after Hurricane Andrew. We, did, we had shutters that we would put on glass. Today, that is superfluous. We design our glazing systems to accommodate the wind loads that are coming through here. And that has put Florida in the forefront of design, innovation, and code. The same thing should and will happen when it comes to flood. As Bruce has just mentioned, the flood panels are not where you need to be. For example, I met with Bruce. We did a basement in Miami Beach in a low-laying area. He said to me, ramp up, meet the base flood elevation, and then ramp down. Therefore, you have solved your issue. That is one solution. There are many solutions that we need to implement. And I believe that Bruce, I know Mayor sitting next to me, is, is on the same thought process. And that is where we are. When we had Hurricane Andrew came in 1992, when you count the years, believe it or not, I'm 55, that was very recent. It was 25 years ago. Hopefully, we can accommodate the flood in a much faster way. Now, to be specific to your development question, every developer wants to be on the cutting edge of that. Whether it's Bruno, who I did a basement for in Coconut Grove, or whether it's the courthouse that was built in 1929 on Flagler, has a basement. The surf club, which is finished with Coastal, has a lower level. That has been the standard since Morris Lapidus built Seacoast Towers in the 50s 
on Millionaire's Row. We always had those. We need to accommodate that in our code immediately. And I believe that we are doing so right now. Patrick, I just wanted to bring you in as, uh, you know, a lot of these issues are at the city level, but some of them have to, you know, go to the state level and the federal level. Are you, are you guys getting, you know, in, in your businesses, are you getting the, the level of education, the level of financial support that you need to, to bring these changes in? Um, yeah, and th thank you for the question because the way I look at it, this is much bigger than one building or, or just one of us up here, one engineer. Uh, this is something that goes well beyond any of this. And in order to make that educated uh, you know, decision for where to build the building, where that floodplain should be, where we should be living, you need a certain amount of information. Well, who funds that information typically? That's the federal government, and that should be, I believe, their role to give that information on to the mayors and the local officials, the governors perhaps, to then start setting up the codes, what they should be. And when they don't do that, we are all on the hook for it. You see, you look at a city like Houston, you look at the damage that was caused there, right? A city with basically uh, no regulations, right? No flood codes, no ev evacuation routes. It's somewhat of a free-for-all where you can build. Houston was kind of the most aggressive in building right in right. sort of the danger and, areas. And you see the damage that happens when you have a storm. Well, guess what? When the federal government goes in to help out and all that money that's being spent, that's your money, right? That's taxpayer money. So all of a sudden, we're all on the hook for people that are irresponsible and not thinking ahead. So the way I look at it, we should want the best information, right? We should want the best research. Let's come up with exactly how much sea level will be rising in the next 15, next 30, next 50 years. So we are building resilient buildings, that we have the pumps, we have the roads, we have the infrastructure necessary. Because if you invest on the front end, you're most likely gonna save a lot of money on the tail end. But you have a guy, and, and whoever would like to jump in, uh, Francis, I'd love your opinion. You have a guy in charge of the EPA whose life's mission before he became head of the EPA was to get rid of the EPA. So you tell me how that, that, that translates into government. I'll, I'll, I'll skip that part, but I will, I'll, I'll just say that I, I, think, I, think, yeah, I think we have some of the best architects uh, in the world right now in the city. Uh, I think we don't, we're ground zero for sea level rise and for climate change. I mean, when we have king tides, we have flooding without rain. So uh, we, this is an issue that we can no longer ignore. We have to face it head on. The city uh, of Miami co-applied with Miami-Dade County and with the city of Miami Beach to become one of the 100 resilient cities from the Rockefeller Foundation. And they gave us a grant. We hired a resiliency officer. I helped set up a sea level rise committee, a blue ribbon committee that we have in the city of Miami. And we now have the possibility of passing a $400 million bond, 200 million of which will go in part to address sea level rise and, and climate change in the city of Miami. But we all know that we have to do a lot more. And uh, we have a lot of growth left in us. We've, we're growing at an unprecedented rate. We've grown, our tax base has grown 37% in the last three years alone. That's double digit growth for three consecutive years. And so we know that if we don't invest in our infrastructure, whether it's transportation infrastructure or whether it's climatic infrastructure, resiliency, um, we know that people are gonna make other investment decisions. So our livelihood literally depends on the decisions that we make today and the investments that we make today. Bruce, you're not running for election, I take it, anytime soon. <laughs> could, you, could you answer two questions? One, one is I'd like you to address the, the federal thing about the EPA and then support. The other is uh, we had had a conversation last week about, and some of my colleagues experienced this personally, where during the storm they drove for hours and hours only to be you know, hit another, essentially, they went from a milder storm to a more severe storm. And, and my question is, are we in a place where we should be thinking about having these disaster preparedness in-house, as in, sorry, locally, as opposed to evacuations? Uh, yeah, I agree. First thing is that strong leadership is necessary, and having a strong mayor, I can tell you from experience in Miami Beach, Mayor Levine made the difference. Four years ago, Miami Beach wasn't what it is today. And a strong mayor, strong leaders, you need to make sure you're putting the strong leaders in there that have the right basis or platform of understanding and addressing the issues rather than saying, let's ignore them because it may be politically un undesirable. But the question comes is also is when we do have it, are we getting proper leadership? Uh, FEMA itself doesn't even look at projections of what's happening. 
they're basing on the day's criteria. So it puts our technical people all at a disadvantage to saying what numbers we use. So I think we don't have that at the federal level like we do. The other thing that we're doing is, again, is what happens when you have a storm? And the question comes back is, yes, mass transit needs to be imposed. We need to be looking at reducing the number of cars. We need to be improving our ability to be able to get from place to place, even during these inclement weather times. But we also need to be looking at other things concerning, are we going to actually evacuate? And I can tell you, I go out and meet hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people in Miami Beach, and most of them will tell me, we're not leaving. And that's a key issue here. We need to be looking at our standards, because if our people aren't really going to leave, and they aren't going to do it, then are, should we be designing our facilities to accommodate them, not only during the storm, but following after it and giving those resources? So these are all good questions, and there's a lot of ways of addressing things. Public participation is a key for anybody, whether it's an engineer, a politician, a realtor, a developer, or so forth. You need to know who the people, they're your customers out there. They're the ones we're trying to represent. And that's the reason it's very important that we get the pulse of what's going out there. Because if I don't have the support of this people sitting out here and willing to basically put the money necessary, funding, when Vice President Al Gore came to Miami Beach, he looked at me and said, Bruce, how did you do all this? And I looked at him and I said, not one thing could have been done in a city. There's a lot of smart people, a lot of good solutions. But if we don't have the leadership putting the funding necessary, making the standards and placing them in place, then we're never going to basically achieve and, and address this. Sea level rise is not something to be scared of. We should embrace it and basically use it as a benefit. It's coming. Don't ignore it. Use it as a benefit. Design. Kobe has designed multiple beating, buildings where he's looked and addressed the issue of how sea level rise and how that building can accommodate an adaptive, a, an a iterative type architectural feature in that building's key to allow that building to be fully valued for the full life of the building. Kobe, uh, just in terms of getting a broker or developer to, you know, basically leverage sea, sea level rise and, and talk about how you're designing buildings as a marketing strategy. So can you talk a little bit about what you tell brokers or maybe your our developer clients about, look, this is a reality of Miami, but this is something that we can actually sell. Absolutely. And furthermore, just to touch on what May Mayor Suarez said, is that the following. We are right now, I gave you an analogy about Hurricane Andrew. You're not a superstitious man, I take no, it. No, sir. Uh, Hurricane Andrew came along, and that allowed us to change our code. We are now changing the code to accommodate the flood criteria that has always existed and is existing. Moreover, right now, he mentioned Gore. We are in the process of having the technology of solar panels, which are highly efficient, that then are able to support a battery like a Tesla or a Siemens battery, that can power a car, which then can power a generator. And that package can be financed into your home mortgage loan for $50,000. Most people would go ahead and get that. And as was mentioned, many people do not wish to evacuate, nor does it seem logical. And with hurricane impact and with backup generators that are supplied by solar that does work and is sustainable, not only will it allow people to stay in a safe location, but more so it will help to revert the carbon footprint of this United States of America, which is what's happening in Scandinavian countries which are ahead of us. But we are Americans. We go from one extreme to the next. We have been on fossil fuels for the past 100. We will be on something else for the next 100. And that will help revert what has happened to the world. Whether you like the rise or you think we're changing, it will revert back. It has to. And that's what we're doing here as a civilization. I'll give you a simple example. We're in Miami in a warehouse. The real deal is putting this on the forefront. You have politicians, both local and federal, and you have engineers who run one of the biggest and wealthiest municipalities in the, in the United States sitting here. You have a room full of people who are going to walk away and understand that this is a value creation, just like putting hurricane impact on your next house. Lanar, GL Homes, whoever, nobody puts windows on their house today that is not impact. You can go to Home Depot and get it, and you can get the technology very easily. And that's where we are. Patrick, I'd like you to jump in as well. 
Yeah, and I, I, I don't want to push back on what you said, Kobe, but it goes back to what we're all saying, that it takes leadership. And when you have an administration right now and people like Scott Pruitt, the EPA director, uh, who do not believe in climate change, right? They do not believe in, in the funding and the science behind it. Then we're not going to get the necessary science out there. We're not going to get the necessary funding for solar, for wind, for thermal, for tidal, whatever that next source of energy is going to be, we're not going to get it. And when you look at something like the Paris Climate Accord that was entered into you know, a couple years ago under the previous administration, we are one of two countries in the whole world that has now pulled out of it, us and Syria. Think of that, right? Nicaragua even is just joining it, right? So there's now two countries not involved in thinking about this on a global level. So if we are going to say this is an opportunity, as uh, you know, we just heard, then we better get smart about it and look at it that way. Otherwise, it's going to be a tidal wave that we aren't prepared for. And if the people at the top aren't talking about it like that, then how in the world are we going to have the funding, the science, everything else necessary? Or more importantly, how are we going to make that pivot to get off the fossil fuels that are in large part leading to this accelerated pace of climate change. So it takes both. It takes the science to get ready for it, but then it takes the leadership to find an alternate source. I want to take a little different viewpoint on this one. Uh, the, I, the Paris Climate Accord was great. The comment was, and believe it or not, I actually support Trump pulling out of it. Why? Because the problem is we need to invest that money here. Putting money into a third world country to try to reduce carbon emissions both President Clinton and Vice President Gore have made public statements out there saying that if we reduced our carbon emissions today, we're still going to see climate change and sea level rise because what we've already put in the system is going to cause it. And so we need to be looking at keeping America's economy strong. If you do not have the revenue stream, if you do not have the money here, if Miami Beach's economy ever crashes, do you think we'll be able to do anything? We have to basically invest today, maintain a system that's resilient and can handle it. And we need to invest that money now. And we don't need to be letting our economy go down. So my point is, make it strong today. Yes, we need to be good stewards of the environment. We need to be looking at reducing carbon. But I'm telling you right now, fossil fuels eliminated today will not protect us. This city will go underwater unless we actually take aggressive stands of moving in new standards, new programs, and start incorporating those into our cities and urban areas. Thank you. Francis, there's a, <laughs> there's a few components to, to making a global city, right? One is great weather, great art, great culture, education. I think Miami checks a lot of those boxes. One thing it really is, is woefully behind on is mass transit. And you, you don't have any global city. If New York didn't have the subway system, it wouldn't be New York. You know, if London didn't have it, it wouldn't be London. Hong Kong, you, t you, na you name it. Uh, why is Miami, Miami so behind? And, and what steps are you and other, you know, other politicians and aspiring leaders uh, taking? To well, the reason why we're so far behind is because we haven't done anything, you know, and I think uh, we haven't done anything because uh, oftentimes we're more worried about our parochial interests than we are looking at our county uh, more uh, on, on a macro level. Uh, we've got 2.8 million people roughly in D Miami Dade County, 95 to 97 percent of which use their cars to get to and from work every single day. That means only between three and five percent of people are using transit, whether it's bus or the Metro Rail or the Metro Mover. So I proposed a six-prong extension of our already existing uh, transit system. I wanted it to be well-branded because uh, this is Miami and branding matters in Miami. And so we called it the SMART Plan, the Strategic Miami Area Rapid Transit Plan. In addition to that, I helped negotiate the tri-rail connection to the All Aboard Station, which is being built right now in the city of Miami. And lastly, we have a thriving uh, wheel-based trolley system in Miami that, tran that transports about 450,000 riders a month. It's free, it's clean, and it looks very, very nice. And so we've gone from having very little transit options in Miami to continuing to build on uh, our transit infrastructure. You were going to say something? I just said, who's paying for that? Right. <laughs> well, well, the pay, well, who's paying for the trolleys is all of you are in your sales taxes. When you pay sales taxes, a percentage of those sales taxes flow through to the city, and we're using those funds uh, to pay the trolley system. The, um, 
the Metro Mover and the Metro Rail system are user-based systems. So um, there is a user fee, but that does not cover anywhere near uh, the total amount. So unfortunately, the half cent has been used to cover a lot of operational deficiencies in our transit system. And because of that, we haven't seen the capital expansion that we really needed to continue to grow at the pace that we're growing. If we're growing double, on double digits, in double digits, um, unless we start teleporting each other, um, physics dictates that we have to uh, either aggregate and move ourselves or we're gonna get in a car. And so certainly technology is part of the solution. You have ride sharing companies, um, you have automated, potentially autonomous cars, uh, which will be coming and will make our roads more efficient. And we have a variety of different technologies that are disrupting how we do things every single day. And so certainly, uh, I think we have uh, an obligation as elected officials to make sure that we are exploring as, as uh, forward-thinking technologies for our solutions as we possibly can. But to pay for the smart plan, uh, it's a $3.6 billion investment. And we just set a funding framework where we're going to have some money from the federal government, hopefully, money from the state government, and we're going to have money that we're going to reallocate from our county governments and our city governments. So certainly, it's very, very difficult to do things. To go back to your EPA question, so I will touch on your EP, EPA Thank question you. a little bit. It is very hard to do things without a cooperative uh, environment with other governments. I mean, if you look at our budgets, the city's budget is $700 million. The county's budget is about $7.2 billion. The state budget is $83 billion. And of course, the federal bu budget is multiples of trillions of dollars. So when you aggregate those resources, um, you realize very quickly that if you're gonna put on a, a multi-billion dollar transit system, every single government that you all pay taxes for uh, has to share in those costs. I wish we had a developer on this panel because there's a question, but Kobe, I'm, you're gonna be my proxy developer here. Uh, <laughs> One of the things that I, in New York, uh, a lot of the transit improvements are put upon the developer. So if a developer wants a rezoning in a certain district, they need to put in X hundred million for transit improvements. That's led to a lot of changes around Grand Central. That's led to a lot of changes at Hudson Yards on the west side. Is there anything, any sort of conversation, discussion happening? And any, whoever's got the, the intel on this, please feel free to jump in. But are there any conversations like that happening where a developer says, okay, I'd like to like to go higher or wider, and I will, in exchange, contribute to, to helping build something for the public. Yes, sir. We do it every day. We come in front of the city of Miami specifically. We request that, and the city of Miami has been very acknowledging of it, whether it's the metro, whether it is the train system that's coming to downtown Miami. And by the way, this is nothing new. If you look at the black and white pictures of Miami, you will see the electric trolley that was here, which we have now put the trolley that goes from downtown Miami, and I take it to 29th and Biscayne, where my office is, and it's faster than an Uber. And I have Wi-Fi on board if I want. That just reminds me, sorry, before when Anytime. we started, Amir, uh, you know, thanked you. I don't know if you were here, but you sheltered the real deal during the storm, so thank you for that. Appreciate it. Well, that's a good example because we have a backup generator that's connected to the city of Miami gas line. The gas line is buried because it's buried, it's protected, generally speaking, more than uh, FPNL lines. The backup generator feeds a building that was built in the 1960s for NCR, National Cash Register, as a concrete bunker. So the real deal want to be in there, and we let them be in there because we had air conditioning, we have bathrooms, we even have showers. So you can stay there and relax. It's the convenient. But that is where the future is going. The future is going back to the way we were public transportation, and it's a whole mental change. You have to remember, we're moving very rapidly. This thing, 10 years ago, in Abu Dhabi, I was using a Blackberry. 20 years before that, we flew to the moon, based on JFK, with less data than that. You have to acknowledge the quick movement of technology and watch it. Elon Musk is a, one example. You have this direction. You can watch movies that Leonardo DiCaprio is doing for us and just listen to it and you will see where your future business is, which benefits everybody in the room. Guess what? More and more people are going to move to Florida because the quality of life is superior. It's the only subtropical weather in the lower 48. Mm -hmm. It is arguably one of the best places to live as long as you can conduct your business 
in this kind of form. And that's why so many companies and businesses are looking right now, they're coming through our office, looking to move here and use the HR that we have available and bring additional HR here. You, you talked to, uh, interesting thing you said about celebrities and you know, putting their weight behind these projects. In Miami, a lot of the real estate community are celebrities. So you, I don't know if you were here for the last panel, but every time the panels was introduced, there were big cheers. People are taking selfies with them. Is there anything the real estate community can do using their clout? You have someone like George Perez, you know, a major leader in the community. A lot of the developers here are, are faces of Miami. Is there anything they can do to, to advance this issue? Whoever wants to take that. Yeah, yeah. George Perez, Jean-Paul, his son, we're working with right now on Widwin 25 as an example. Michael Stern, we're doing the Monad on 14th Street where he's raising the streets. That's Miami and Miami Beach. It's across the board. By he, Amar, Fort Lauderdale, we're doing same kind of logic and technology that Bruce was mentioning. We need to see this as an opportunity to create a greater value. And what we're going to see very shortly is, as much as Miami is great and it's wonderful, it is a small little community compared to the rest of the cities. I'll give you some example. Forget Mexico City and how many millions you have there. Look at Lima, Peru. Barranco, Miraflores, when you put them all together, it's nine million people. They're three times our size. Yeah, but I'll I think, go ahead. Uh, I'll add real quick. With the void of leadership at certain levels of government right now on this issue, it is going to be up to the local architects and engineers and local officials who stay involved in the broader thinking about climate change and the local developers who are in many cases making the decisions on how they're going to spend that money. So it is going to, in large part, be up to them. And I think one of the sort of core questions of this panel of today and this room that is here is looking at this over the next 15, 20 years that if sea level continues at this pace, right, it has been uh, noticeable just in, in my lifetime here in Miami, if it continues, and, and 15, 20 years are saying another two to three, maybe even six inches of sea level rise. If that continues, I'm sure the engineer Bruce here will tell us what that means for under, uh, you know, underground uh, parking garages, what that means for streets. When you have people investing in real estate who are buying condos that say, wow, in 15 years from now, I'm gonna sell this and make some money, right? That's the, the value proposition. But what can I sell that for if there's no place to park my car? If all of a sudden I can't drive on the streets, if the air and the water and the storms are too dramatic, I don't even wanna live there and there's no beaches anymore. If that starts to happen because people aren't making those investments, we got a big problem on our hands here in South Florida. But I think Miami and Miami Beach have a great opportunity to become the model for the world. I think we have the kind of people here that actually want to take that step. They're not scared to take this step. They're to a certain extent risk takers, but they also want to manage risk. And so I think what we ought to be doing is making this the opportunity for Miami Beach and the city of Miami to become the model that the world comes to see. Bring those people here learn from them, but I also learn a lot when people come visit us also, because I ask the question, what are you doing at home? And sometimes they have great ideas, and sometimes they tell us, hey, we're here because we don't have an answer, and we're looking for one. So I think these are things. One other thing I want to mention when Kobe brought up his cell phone, many people look at these cities and say, because of your wealth, you're able to do things. I tell them, in Miami Beach, our whole stormwater program is less than the monthly cost of one cell phone per household. As all we're actually collecting and we're doing what we're doing in Miami Beach and people look at the world and said, look at what you're doing. And I said, but it's not that expensive if you're making the commitment. But that means every household needs to pay a cost because we all share the same city. It's not just because the rich and the famous are here, it's because every Everybody here, there are a lot of people aren't rich and famous, but they also need and help, and they're willing to help for the quality of life that they want. Miami and Miami Beach are some of the best places to live in the world. I've been all over the world. For over 40 years, I've worked in the industry all over the world, and I'm telling you what, Miami and Miami Beach are the best places in the world. I think he is running for election. He just hasn't announced it yet. But one, one question for you. Didn't you get a lot of pushback on raising the streets, Miami Beach? There was a lot of... Lot of Anxiety, there was a lot of anger. Just address that if you could. Uh, yes. Anytime you have some Miami Beach residents. We have Miami Beach residents here. Yeah. Yep, that's what I thought. Go ahead. There's always resilient resistance to change. Uh, and re change like this is very, very rapid. 
Uh, when we look at sea level rise, it's chronic, it's slow over a long period of time. That's the reason many people don't do it. But when I go out there and physically raise a street, a foot or 18 inches or so, it's dramatic. Do we have all the answers? Do we always do the right thing? We make mistakes, but we also learn from those mistakes. At least we're taking the step forward. Most people around the world are still talking about this, and the biggest problem you can do is procrastinate, talk, and give excuses. We need to move ahead. Are we always going to make the right decision? The mayor is not going to always make the right decision. You're going to make bad ones. But the question is, if you learn from them, it's what we want to do. And so Miami Beach, yes, there is resistance. Yes, we have some mistakes. Yes, we're going back and correcting those. Those are all important things. Mm. But I'm telling you, we're developing concepts that other people can learn from. We ex need to share that with them so they don't make the same mistakes we have made. It's Bruce Mowry for mayor.com. So check it out. Uh, one, one question, Francis, for you. He doesn't I just, live in I just, the city, <laughs> so I don't have to worry about it. He can run for Miami Beach mayor if he wants. I, I wanted to ask you just... You know, if, if things go according to plan and you yeah. are the next mayor, um, what sort of dialogue would you like to have with the real estate community in, in this room and a and right. larger community about moving this issue forward? Well, I think, uh, first of all, initially, when we started seeing this phenomenon occurring in a greater uh, intensity, we started thinking of water as an enemy. Everything was about let's pump water out or let's raise our streets or what, whatever the case may be. When you look at other cities around uh, the world, uh, like Copenhagen, for example, that I went to visit, they think of water as an asset. And water is an asset. It can be reused, uh, and it should be reused. Uh, it can be sold. I mean, it, it can be harvested. It can be part of our landscape. And so water, we have to start changing the conversation a little bit. Uh, I think the second piece is uh, that we brought in the conversation, not just to sea level rise, but to being resilient. And I think... Uh, Kobe uh, said it very well. Uh, we need to have a resilient infrastructure. It's not just, a res it's not just a against climatic shocks, whether they be short-term or long-term, but our electrical grid, is a, it's a big issue. You know, when I was talking about the water that came in and on Brickell, that receded in 24 hours. So in 24 hours, you were able to drive back into Brickell. But you know what? Brickell was probably one of the first places to have power in the city of Miami. Why? Because all of the energy infrastructure is underground. And so uh, we have to take a long, hard look at how we can be a more resilient city. When we rebuild our roads, we should, like when we, when we got off of a septic tank and went to sewer system, we should have uh, underground el electrical lines that you can hook up to um, in your homes. Uh, we obviously should, and I will be proposing in the future, incentives to incentivize people who build and buy uh, new homes to retrofit their homes with solar panels. Obviously, the f one of the first things that you saw when you arrived here is Tesla, a Tesla car. And we are, we're working with Tesla to potentially have uh, a supercharging stations throughout the city of Miami so that you can, if you buy a Tesla, uh, you can for free charge your Tesla. So imagine you're driving a car. Now that the Tesla 3 is $35,000, it's, it's the price of the average car. And you can go around the city and power your car for free. You never have to pay gas again in your life. And so when you talk about the climatic impacts of you know, the environmental impacts of not polluting our environment, combined with the fact that, there are, that, that the marginal cost of electricity or energy is zero for the consumer, I mean, that is a game changer. That is a complete game changer, and it will change completely the way uh, we live here on Earth. I, wanna, I just want to end with a confession. So this, this panel to talk about sea level rise is our publisher's idea, and when he proposed it, I was a little skeptical. I was worried that we'd just have the first two rows filled up, and then we'd have some people waiting outside. However, just looking at the audience, it's, it's indicative of how important this issue is to all of you. So I'd like to thank you guys very much for being here and listening, and thank all the panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you.